In this video, we're going to be continuing our analysis of randomized recursive algorithms. In this example here, we have something similar to before. We have some base case up here. We're then computing two random numbers. And then if the first random number is less than the second, we will re return a n. And if it's not, we're going to make two recursive calls. Let's begin like we did before by looking at the worst case runtime. The worst case runtime is t of n is equal to all of the stuff that's not recursive, assigning two random values, doing some if statements. All of that takes constant time. Plus, we have two recursive calls to make. What needed to be true for this to occur, that would need to be that k1 is greater than or equal to k2 every time. Whether or not that's likely or not, we may address later, but for now, that's just what we know. We'll come back and analyze this once we get our expected case runtime, but you may recognize that recurrence relation as one we have seen before. So let's come up with our expected runtime, our expected case is ex the expected time is equal to the probability that k1 less than k2 times the expected time given that k1 less than k2 plus the probability that the opposite is true k1 greater than or equal to k2 times the expected time given that k1 greater than or equal to k2 how likely are those probabilities? You may not intuitively have a good sense of this, so let's try and understand it. I'm actually gonna do this graphically. I think this is the best way to understand it. I'm going to draw two axes here. We're gonna have a K1 axis and a K2 axis. These variables go from one to N and one to N. And here we're trying to understand an inequality. Sometimes the best way to understand an inequality is by graphing the equality between them and understanding geometrically how are you relating. So the idea of when does k1 equal k2, depending on where we lie on a line relating to that, it will tell us something about the probability. So let's draw in a line corresponding to k1 equals k2. You could have used different letters like x and y if they made you feel more comfortable, but it's better to keep with the variables of the problem. And now we want to know, let's draw a little box here. This box corresponds to all of the possible outcomes. Every single coordinate within that box, coordinates like k1 equals 4 and k2 equals nine, n minus 3, Things like that are in that box. We want to know how much of that box corresponds to K1 being less than K2. Where is that graphically in this box? Where is that graphically in this box? There are definitely two possible answers. It's either down here, or it is up here. When we are above that line, the y values are greater than the x values, which means that k2 is greater than k1. So up here, k2 is greater than k1, and down below, k1 is greater than k2. If we look, that orange box is the exact same condition as appears in this if statement there. And the purple box must therefore be my else condition. Plus the red line of equality there. If we're imagining that n is arbitrarily large, the chances of picking two random numbers and having them both be equal is 1 over n, and that trends to 0 as n goes towards infinity. So it will not affect us. So, how can we understand what this geometry tells us about the probability? If we can figure out what proportion of that box is occupied by the orange triangle, that will tell us the probability that two randomly picked values will satisfy the orange inequality. 
So, let's figure out the area of the orange box. Area of the triangle is one half. The base of that box is n, and the height of that box is n. So that's n squared over two. The area of the box would be base times height, which is n squared. So the relative area of the orange portion, this is n squared over two over n squared, which is the same as one half. You may have been able to come up with this in a much easier way, but this gets more difficult when you have other uglier inequalities that you might need to satisfy between two variables. This technique generalizes. If you want to know, for two variables that are sampled uniformly, how likely is it that they relate according to some simple inequality, you could find the area of that region on some sort of 2D plot like this, and it would work. Here, you may have noticed that there is no difference fundamentally between K1 and K2, so the odds that one is greater than the other is just one half. But this idea generalizes to more complicated problems and more complicated inequalities. That's a very long-winded way to say that we know something about this probability here. It's one half, which means that the opposite probability must also be one half. Now let's continue marching forward with our analysis. This means e t of n equals one half times what is the expected runtime given that we have k1 less than k2 that means that we are in the orange region which means that the only thing that occurs is finding the random variables and then returning so that takes constant time otherwise we are in the purple region which we still have that constant time operation but then we make two recursive calls one of size m minus one and one of size m minus two Let's bring all of that together. And we have 1 half times c plus 1 half times c plus the expected time of n minus 1 plus the expected time of n minus 2. Let's distribute and collect together like terms. This equals 1 half c plus 1 half c is just c plus one half e t of n minus one plus one half e t of n minus two. Now, this doesn't look like a very pleasant thing to analyze. In all the times in the past when we had multiple chip and conquers, our goal was to bound it below by an exponential function. But now we have this strange hang up where we have one halves in front, so that might not work. So let's try and bound this both above and below and see what happens. I'm going to bound it above first. I can make this bigger by replacing the smaller of the two recursive calls, the n minus two recursive call, with the larger of the two. So we replace the et of n minus two with an et of n minus 1. That definitely makes it bigger. This equals c plus et of n minus 1. And I'm actually going to keep the inequality here just to be true. So now we can do some substitutions. These substitutions are really easy because we are just doing a chip and conquer and our additional cost is constant. So et of n less than or equal to c plus c plus et of n minus 2. This chunk over here coming from a substitution. Do another substitution and we have 2c plus c plus et of n minus 3. So et of n is less than or equal to kc plus e t of n minus k. We want to solve n minus k equals our base case in this problem will be 2. So k equals n minus 2. 
bt of n is less than or equal to n minus 2 times c plus et of 2. et of 2 is just constant, so we are in big O of n. Now we must show that it is in big omega of n. I will show it's in big omega of n in blue here. So let's go back up to the original. If I want to bound this below, I can replace the larger of the two recursive calls with the smaller. So let's do that. We have e t of n is greater than or equal to. The c stays around. The larger of the two gets replaced by the smaller. So the et of n minus 1 changes the et of n minus 2. And the other et of n minus 2 will hang around. Let's group together our like terms. We have c plus et n minus 2. This is greater than or equal to c plus c plus et of n minus 4 which is greater than or equal to c plus c plus c plus et of n minus 6, which is greater than or equal to kc plus et of n minus 2k. We want to solve n minus 2k equals 2, which is k equals n minus 2 over 2. This is greater than or equal to n minus 2 over 2 times c plus et of 2, which again is just constant. So, this is in big omega of n, therefore, et of n is in beta of n. How does this help us or what does this do for us? Well, let's go up. We have an expected time of n and a worst case that obeys this sort of ugly looking recurrence relation that we've seen here. So let's find out what that worst case runtime actually is. So let's do that down here. Worst case, t of n is equal to c plus t of n minus 1 plus t of n minus 2. We are going to bound this below. Why do we bound this below? This should look a lot like the Fibonacci sequence. In fact, it's the same, so we're going to go through it kind of quickly. This is greater than or equal to. I can drop all of the other terms and then replace the larger recursive call with a copy of the smaller. So replace the t of n minus 1 with a t of n minus 2 and keep the other t of n minus 2 around. And now we'll perform several substitutions. This is 2 t of n minus 2. Perform a substitution, and then we get 2 times 2 t of n minus 4. Do another substitution, and we get 2 times 2 times 2 t of n minus 6. And we notice a pattern of t of n is greater than or equal to 2 to the k, t of n minus 2k. We want to solve n minus 2k equals our base case of 2, which is k equals n minus 2 over 2. Plugging that in, we have t of n greater than or equal to 2 to the n minus 2 over 2 times t of 2 t of 2 is just 1, or sorry, t of 2 is just constant. So our worst case is in omega of 2 to the n over 2, which is the same as omega of radical 2 to the n. I again did that kind of quickly because we've seen that before. If you need to go through it more slowly, do not be afraid to do so, but I did not do that here. So our worst case runtime is bounded below by an exponential, but our actual runtime is in theta of n. These are about as divergent as you could possibly see for something like this. We have a very, very nice expected time and a very ugly worst case runtime. What is our best case runtime? Well, our best case runtime is actually constant. 
our best case runtime would be that we just do this, call to random numbers, and then it immediately returns. So our best case actually, our best case runtime is theta of one. So again, we have a broad spectrum here. Part of the reason the worst case is so bad is that we get this exponential increase in the number of recursive calls that leads to this exponential lower bound. And our expected case, the only way that that could happen, that exponential increase, is that you continually pass these thresholds of uh, half of a probability. So half of the time, we immediately terminate and have a constant runtime. And then we can continually compute that and see how unlikely it is that that worst case would actually occur. And that unlikeliness of the worst case is part of the reason that the expected case ends up being so divergent from it.